cleans my guilt and pride. Blood of Christ the crucified. From your hands, your feet, your side. Jesus, I trust in you. Okay, so in our sequence of events, then there is coming a great harvest in the tribulation. Right? It's going to begin. The next thing in that sequence of events that we're talking about. Um, and we call this a great and a fast growing harvest. And this was also given to Merlene, and uh, she said, This is a dream of me planting seed in a flat and dry area. Folks, there is a, uh, a drought and a famine coming on the world, and especially the United States, because we've got people monkeying out there to try to destroy the United States. We've proven that. I'm not going to go into that today, but they're monkeying with the weather on purpose, and they're flooding out the bread basket where the farmers can't hardly get out in the field and plant their seeds. They know what's going to happen. They're doing it on purpose. Anyway, um, so this was a dream of Merlin planting seeds in a flat and a dry area. She said, I wore a long, light-colored dress and head covering of the same material. The sleeves were long, but rolled up, so even though the day was quite warm, I was comfortable. And I had a, a sling-type pouch, which was put over my over the head and resting on the shoulder across the front. It very much reminded me of the front sling that some women use for their newborns. And uh, the pouch was full of seed as I began the planting. Notice this is the beginning of the planting, the beginning of the great harvest, right? Ooh, hallelujah. And of course that seed is the Word of God. Yeah. Now the soil was sandy and different from what I would normally think it would be for planting. I saw the soil blow in the wind in the distance, but gently. Not like a, a sandstorm, uh, but peaceful. There were acres of flat land to be planted. So this land represents, I believe, the dry hearts of the people of this world. Uh, the much land to be planted speaks of the beginning of the planting season or the tribulation to come. As she said before, she began to plant. Right? She said, I bent over at the waist and my bare feet were on each side of a long row that had already been prepared for the seed I was planting. Then I would gently cover the seed with the tips of my fingers. I didn't need to water as it somehow was watered after I had covered it. Well, I think I have an explanation for that. The seed of the Word is also the water of the word. Remember the washing of the water with the word? Right. Okay. So it has its own water. It is the water. Right. And this seed, uh, all it needs to be is planted in the earth, and which is in your flesh, which is where your flesh comes from, the earth. Right. You will spend time planting the word of God in your flesh you will have fruit of Jesus. It is a supernatural word, right? There was a knowing that I should not look back, but just keep focused on the row. And so just sow your seed and walk by faith and not by sight, right? You don't need to look back. Just plant and go. Then there was a, a side view of the row where I could see a progression of growth from the one I had just planted, which was about to break through the sand. That's fast. Yeah. And the first one that I planted, which was about five feet tall. Wow. 
she just started and um first one was five feet tall and the other one was breaking the ground right behind her hey that's great man that's the kind of harvest we need right <laughs> no hanging around we'll just see fruit right away and that's exactly what's going to happen you know why because we have a short time left Lord is going to give much grace to bear much fruit in these days, and quickly. There's going to be much fruit, and many are going to grow very fast by grace. As I looked at this view, a sense of accomplishment and joy came over me. I bet you, you know, we've struggled to see fruit in these days, but in the days to come, especially when the harvest begins, uh, we're going to see something quite different going to be very graceful. And and not only that, everybody's going to be highly motivated with the fear of the Lord because of the things that are happening around them. You know, All this is going to make for the grace, the outpouring of the latter rain, the restoration of all things, and the fear of the Lord. These are a, a dynamic a combination that is just going to cause people to grow very quickly. Children are going to be running around doing miracles, folks. Um, now you, you've got a lot of children that with beards, as my my old friend Bolivar used to say, he had a revelation of children with beards. They've been around a long time, but they're still children. Well, that's that's not going to happen. You're either going to get in or you're going to get out. And uh, the ones that don't get in and don't you know get off the the fence are going to fall away. So, and in First Corinthians three. Six through eight, we're told, I planted, uh, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So, you know, I planted, somebody just planted, and they went on. They didn't look behind them. Apollos came along and watered. You know, know there's evangelists that go out and plant, and then there's teachers that follow behind, and, and they water. So then, neither he that planteth, is anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And so is the fivefold ministry to raise up the saints, right? But each shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. Amen. Glory be to God. In this dream, there were no other trees except those which were in the distance, far from me. That means we we all got a lot of work to do, but the Lord's going to empower us to do it, right? And also, I was alone. I saw no other person, but in other words, this is going to be an individual thing. We we are called to to minister to the people around us and speak things to the people around us. We're not dependent upon somebody else. We individually have to do this, right? It's the Great Commission. Also, I was alone. I saw no other person, but yet I knew that I was never really alone. That's right. It's the Lord. And if it's the Lord is not there, uh, it's a waste of time. Somehow, my seed never ran out. And the seeds were then watered as they needed to be. And I don't remember ever being thirsty. I was being watered also. So these seeds are sown in the hearts of men, like the the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, right? Amen. Okay, that was our our sequence of events. And I think I'm going to share something with you here. Put my computer aside a minute and pick up my Bible here. Share this with you. Um... And I'm going to start in John chapter 10. What about this division that the Lord is doing? Is it going to stop now? No, it's going to be happening for quite some time, but we're we're coming to the end of the first stage of it. And uh, I just want to read John chapter 10 because it has a lot to say about this. It says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Jesus said, uh, He that entereth not in by the door, but uh, into the fold of the sheep, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He said everybody that came before him was a thief and a robber. In other words, you've got to follow him, right? And he's got to lead you through the door, right? Uh, but he that entereth 
in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth. The sheep hear his voice. And uh, he calleth his own by name, his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. Of course, this is the, what the Lord did when he came, and it is what the man-child will do when he is anointed, leading the sheep out of the sheepfold. And um, and when he, and of course, that entails a separation. Think about how this is going to happen on the earth. It's it's a separation. He's making a separation. There are some that are going to stay in the sheepfold, and there's some that are going to follow the Lord out. And if you don't follow the Lord, you won't come out from among them. Right? And when he hath put forth all of his own, he goeth before them, just like Jesus did. All those people came out of the denominations of Judaism, and they followed Jesus. They came out. And the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Wow. So many people don't know his voice. You share the word with them, and it goes in one ear out the other, and they don't are not affected by it. They have no ears to hear and no eyes to see. You ask them to read the word so they can find out things. They have no interest in the word. They are, do not have that gift. They are not drawn. And they'd rather just have some preacher go and study and come back and tell them how it is. They have no personal interest in the Lord themselves. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. So you see, the righteous people are going to be separated in the fact that they follow the Lord, they know his voice, and they're not going to hang with the the crowd, you know. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Jesus therefore said unto them, Again, verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that came before me are thieves and robbers. Notice he's talk, not talking about the devil. He's talking about the leadership that was there when he came. And the leadership that is here when he comes again. It's the same thing. But the sheep did not hear them. I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but that he may steal, kill, and destroy. And I came that they might have life. What is he talking about? These preachers, that people, just as we were talk, sharing in our revelation, these preachers, who are doing their own thing, they're stealing, they will kill, and they destroy. And uh, you know what's going to happen to those that fall away after persecuting the man-child? They're going back under the worthless shepherds, just as we read. And what are they going to do? They're going to destroy, bring people right back to Babylon, folks. I've seen it happen, and I saw it, because the Lord pointed it out to me. But I'm the good shepherd, and the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. So this is a sacrificial person here. The true shepherds are going to be sacrificial people. They will give of their lives for the sheep. They will sacrifice themselves. People will say they don't have a life, but that's wrong. Their life is the sheep. That's a lie. Their life is the sheep. They love the sheep. They're, they uh, they grieve over the sheep's troubles and and problems, you know, because they love the sheep, right? So it's okay. They're fanatics, but they know it. <laughs> and uh, I'll, I'll share another text with you. We're talking about the nature of this um, and the progression of this separation of people, right? Matthew 10, I'm going to read to you verse 34. Think not that I came to send peace on the earth, well, we see we can see that, Lord. <laughs> we can understand that. I came not to send peace, but a sword. Because there can't be any peace as long as you're being leavened by the people around you. There has to be a separation. So that's what the sword represents here, a separation. For I came to set a man at variance against his father 
and the daughter against her mother? See, some of you are grieved over the separation that Christianity has made in your life. But it's quite natural. Don't worry about it. Just pray for them and go on and follow Jesus. If you don't follow Jesus, you don't have any special privileges from the Lord or favor from God as far as your family is concerned. You know, the woman who is righteous can gain her husband. The, the husband who is righteous can gain his wife because of his righteousness. I read 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and you'll see that I'm telling you the truth. And um, the daughter against her mother and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. So there is a division in families when you grow up in God. But believe me, if you hold on in God and you grow in God and you're faithful to him, he'll be faithful to you in taking care of your family and bringing them in as you believe. If you don't have any faith and you don't have any fruit, what do you think you're going to get from God? Right? He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. See, if you've got an idol, even in families, listen to me carefully now. Okay? Even in families, you have a responsibility to the Lord. Recently we talked about husbands and wives, how that wives quite often listen to their husbands because that's their head. However, the Lord Jesus is the head above the head. And if the head goes astray, the wife don't go astray with the head. We were talking about um, the demands of Scripture concerning um, the attempts of devil, the devil to, to separate. And, uh, you know, uh, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established, the Bible says. And um, if if the wife sits and listens to the husband, for instance, and the husband is uh, spewing out um, slander, or he hasn't obeyed the word as far as going to the person uh, that um, he's speaking about, Matthew 18 and 15, or he's receiving an accusation against an elder, without two or three witnesses, and he's speaking these things into the wife, and the wife's receiving it, even though she knows it's wrong, guess what? If he falls into a faction, she's fallen into it too. I saw it happen time and time again, and I can tell you, I know that's the reason. It's idolatry. No, wife, you are responsible to obey the same rules behind your closed doors and you, husband, you're responsible to obey those rules. If you don't do it, you will not be protected from the devil. He will ravage you. The wife that doesn't obey the, the commands and the rules of relationships within the church, and her husband falls away, she's going to fall away too. You're responsible. It doesn't matter that you're at home behind closed doors with your husband, you still can't sin there. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he, he that does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. What happens when you're not worthy? Well, you end up falling away. Now you can go totally brain dead, too. I've seen some people do it. Totally brain dead. Demons are stupid. When they come in, they can make you just as stupid as you can be. You won't even know it. That's the thing. I've seen it many times. You won't even know it. You'll just be puffed up doing your own thing, probably railing at somebody, and um, you won't even know how foolish you are, but the whole world can look at you and see you are. Except somebody else that's in the same condition, <laughs> and, then they, and then they fall away too, so... Um, because that's the way God cleans his body. Cleans his body. The people that fall away, they want nothing to do with the righteous. Whew, there's a sword. Okay. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake shall find it. Well, that's interesting. Uh, so does it truly happen for husbands and wives? Yeah, look at Luke 14 and uh, 26. Let me read that to you. 
If any man cometh unto me and hateth not his own father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. You want to be a disciple? Follow Jesus. If your husband wants to lead you in Jesus, that's good. If he wants to lead you in sin, you have to resist. Now, there are some things that you can do or not do that that don't necessarily mean sin, and you can follow your husband. Obviously, you should follow your husband. He's your head. You know, Paul said, follow me as I follow the Lord. And the Bible even says for a woman that um, uh, even if her husband obeys not the word, she's to obey him. On the you know everyday things that we do and uh, submission in the house and all these things she's to obey him that even if any obeyeth not the word they might be won by your chaste behavior it says so don't think your husband has to be perfect but don't have to lead you in sin you do something that'll open you up to demons you're not protected what makes you think you're protected if you're going to live in sin in your own house you're not protected you have a responsibility to Submit to the Lord as you submit to your husband, right? Whosoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. There it is again. So it does apply to wives in the household, right? And also, let me point out Acts chapter 3 to you. Folks, there's... um, God is going to judge people in these coming days according as as how they treat the man-child ministry because that's Jesus coming. And, and whatsoever you've done to the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me because Jesus, to, to a more or less extent, is in every Christian. So you have to be careful how you treat Jesus. And if you treat Jesus wrongly, you're going to be in trouble. Here's an example of this in Acts chapter 3. I'll we'll start in verse 19. It says, Repent ye therefore, and turn again, that your sins may be blotted out, so that there may come seasons of refreshing from the presence of the Lord. Praise the Lord. We want that. We want this refreshing from the Lord. Because the Lord is coming. And that he may send the Christ who hath been appointed for you, even Jesus. Is he sending the Christ? Yes, he is. And most people don't even know it. And they think he's he's coming to cause them to fly away. But he's not. He's coming in his people. And he's not taking them out of this world until the end of the tribulation period. He said, I will raise them up at the last day. The last day. And um, the last enemy to be conquered is death. And that's what the rapture does, folks. The last enemy to be conquered is death. Uh, The rapture and the resurrection of the dead is the conquering of death. And it's the last. It's not first. It's the last trump. It's not first. That's just a bunch of baloney from a bunch of false shepherds. Whom the heavens must receive, so that's true, Jesus has gone to heaven, uh, until the time of the restoration of all things. And all, of course, is talking about all people here. Until the restoration of all, whereof God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets that have been from of old. So Jesus has gone to heaven until the time of the restoration of all things. And when do we know God is going to restore all things? We know that Prophet Joel spoke about the restoration of all things. It's going to come through the latter rain, and the full restoration of all things is at the end, right? It's it's going to be a progressive thing through the tribulation all the way up until the end, right? And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, according to Joel, was a part of that. And uh, and whereof God spake by the mouth of his holy prophets that have been from of old. So he, he spoke of this, obviously, through Joel and other places. And verse 22, 
And Moses indeed said, A prophet shall the Lord God raise up unto you from among your brethren, like unto me. Who is that? That was Jesus, and that's the man-child, like unto me. And to him shall you hearken in all things whatsoever he shall speak unto you. Why is the man-child so important? The, the man-child is like a lightning rod. You know, he is, um, uh, many people are against him. Many people speak against him. He is uh, a prophet, an apostle. He is those things that Jesus was and spoken to be. And he, it, because it is Jesus coming in uh, a, co- a larger corporate body of the, the first fruits in order to minister to the whole world. And, and he says that um, to him shall you hearken in all things whatsoever he shall speak unto you. And it shall be that every soul that shall not hearken unto that prophet, he shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Yea, and all the prophets from Samuel and them that followed after as many as have spoken, they also told of these days. So, it's very important that you obey uh, this prophet because this prophet is the Son of God coming in his people. And uh, he is going to be the standard by which the Lord is going to judge. He has been given authority to judge because he is Jesus in a fleshly body. And he is coming in you. So don't say that that doesn't happen. If he's not in you, then you are indeed reprobate, the Bible says. People don't understand what the Christianity is all about. Christianity is Christ in you. They were Christians because Christ spoke unto them the words of life. And his words came out of him and went into them and recreated him in them. And uh, He said, my words are spirit and they are life. The man-child's words are going to be spirit, and they are life, the spirit and life of Jesus. And if people listen to them, fine. If they don't, they're going to be reprobated. Because there's no other go-around this time, okay? So, So we see that this is the separation. How are they going to treat this prophet? This is the separation. You want to see it again? Well, look in 1 Peter, chapter 2, verse 5. You also, as living stones, are built up a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Because it is contained in scriptures. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. That's Jesus in the bride, right? And he that believeth on him shall not be put to shame. For you therefore that disbelieve is the preciousness. Excuse me. (laughs) You therefore that believe is the preciousness. But for such as disbelieve, the stone which the builders rejected. Hmm. Are they still doing that today? Yep, they're still rejecting the stone. The same was made the head of the corner. So, so God didn't pay a bit of attention. They could reject him if they wanted, but he's still going to be the boss. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. So who, when the people that stumble and are separated, what are they stumbling over? Jesus. Jesus and the man-child. They're uh, rebelling against the authority, like a Korah rebellion, like an Absalom rebellion. Right? For they stumble at the word being disobedient. You'll notice that they don't care about the word. They have their demons entered into them and just took away their desire to be obedient. Whereunto also they were appointed. So those two-thirds, were they appointed into this? Yes. But you're an elect race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may show forth the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Ooh. Boy, I tell you, saints, some people should be trembling for the Lord. Matthew 13. We're still talking about 
separation. Matthew 13, as you know, um, the disciples complain that Jesus um, speaking to their Jewish brethren and or the old order brethren, which we have in Christianity too, um, in in parables, and they didn't understand. And Jesus said, well, to you it's been given to know the mystery of the kingdom, but they, to them it's not given. So the same thing is happening now. Okay, Some people do not have eyes to see or ears to hear, and they will not receive. So then we see these four groups that I spoke about earlier, mentioned down from 16 on down. And uh, three of those, of course, received the seed. Some were joyful, and so on and so forth, but only one bore fruit another separation. And then we come to the next parable a little further down, verse 24. See, this this nature of separation is going to be from here on out. We're just coming to the end of this first stage, but it's from here on out. And verse 24 says, Another parable said he before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that sowed good seed in his field. But while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tares also among the wheat and went away. And by the way, folks, there are people who have been sown in your midst who are tares. They don't bear fruit. They don't bear fruit of the word. Those are tares. Okay? Remember that. When they fall away, they may be good friends and it may hurt your heart but they have to be taken out because a little leaven leavens the whole lump. But when the blade sprang up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. And the servants of the householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst thou, didst thou not sow good seed in thy field? Whence hath it tares? And he said unto them, An enemy hath done this. Yeah, the devil did this while people were sound asleep. And um, Anyway, and the servants... Say unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he saith, Nay, lest happily when you gather up the tares, you root up the wheat with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather up. Now, did we just talk about the harvest? Yeah, the harvest starts at the beginning and ends at the end of the tribulation period, right? Okay. I will say to the reapers, gather up first the tares. Bind them in bundles to burn them. Is this happening now? Yes! He's bundling the tares now. Birds of a feather flock together. They get separated from you and they gather together. And sometimes they gather together against you. It's just the nature. It's what Jesus said is going to happen. Uh, But gather the wheat into my barn. So let's jump on down and get the interpretation. They said in verse 36, Explain unto us the parable of the tares of the field. And he answered, and he said, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, and the field is the world, and the good seed, these are the sons of the kingdom. And the tares are the sons of the evil one. How can tares be sown among you and you not realize they are sons of the evil one? How do you tell the difference between sons of the evil one and sons of the righteous one? Well, the tares don't bear fruit. They have a tiny little old fruit, but when the wheat starts bearing more and more fruit, there's a big difference starts showing up because the tares don't bear fruit. And it's the fruit of the word. Again, these that have no desire for the word or to submit to it or to submit to the crucified life, they're tares. That's who they are. Will they last? No. They'll be bundled together. They'll persecute you, but they'll be bundled together. It will be proven. They cannot obey. They love to judge, too, and be critical. They love to be vessels of the devil who does what we read in that revelation, you know, slanders and the righteous, you know. And um, the tares are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy that sowed them is the devil. And the harvest is the end of the world, or the age. And the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered up and burned with fire, so shall it be in the end of the world. The Son of Man shall send forth his angels, and they shall gather out of his kingdom all 
that cause stumbling and them that do iniquity. So the angels will do this. Yeah, and sometimes it's not good angels, it's bad angels that do this. You know that the Lord sent a bad angel to, to Saul. And he sent a bad angel to the prophets of Ahab to deceive him, to go into destruction. You know, All of the angels are the Lord's. Uh, you'll find that out if you just read the scriptures a little bit. All of them belong to him, the good ones and the bad ones. He is sovereign over them. And uh, if he turns you over to the tormentors, that's the demons. That's the demon angels, right? And they are called angels in the scriptures. I'm sorry if people don't believe that. It's it's just there. So anyway, they shall gather out of his kingdom uh, all that cause stumbling and them that do iniquity. So good angels and bad angels will do this work of cleansing the body by gathering out people that cause stumbling. Mm Mm-hmm. Is it happening? Yes, more so than it's ever been in history, and it's going to happen even more later. But right now, he's cleansing the body, getting ready for a certain group of people to follow the man-child into the wilderness. He said, the bride is the bridegroom. And shall cast them into the furnace of fire. Well, What is that? Well, we know that the Hebrews went into the furnace of fire, right? And they were uh, perfectly preserved, right? But these folks are not. They shall into the furnace of fire, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then shall the righteous shine forth in the sun, as the sun, in the kingdom of their father. He that hath ears, let him hear. Shine forth in the kingdom of their father. Hallelujah. That interesting, and you know, in um, Matthew twenty-five, we're told, verse eleven, and when the Son of Man shall come in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then shall He sit on the throne of His glory. Oh, what is this? We'll find out. He comes in His glory. And he sits on glory. And before him shall be gathered all the nations, and he shall separate them one from another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. When is he going to do this? Same time as when the the, uh, tares and the wheat. And is it something that we see uh, in the letter? No, it isn't. He comes and sits in his glory, the Bible says comes in his glory. Now, what is this glory that he's coming in? And how is he doing this, separating the the goats from the sheep and the tares from the wheat? Well, it's going on, and it's going to continue to go on. And this separation is happening. And, And the criterion was, hey, I was hungry, and you gave me to eat. And I was thirsty, and you gave me to drink. And I was stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and they said... Then the righteous answered, Lord, when when did this happen? When did this happen to us? He said, well, inasmuch as you did it unto one of these my brethren, even these least, you did it unto me. Oh, so those who walk and talk as Jesus, be careful how you treat them. Be very, very careful how you treat them. Because... Some people are about to be reprobated. Some people are being reprobated even now, just as we saw in Matthew 13. So there's a separation going on. And, of course, those that didn't treat his brethren properly said, Lord, when did we do all these bad things to you? He said the same thing to them. He said, well, inasmuch as you did it unto one of these least, you did it unto me. These shall go away unto eternal punishment, but the righteous unto eternal life. That's the last verse of the chapter. Okay. So what is this glory he's coming in to do this with? Well, I suggest to you, if you look in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, it says, We are bound to give thanks unto God always for you, brethren, 
as it is meet, for that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the love of each one of you towards one another aboundeth. Who's got? Who's born from above? Who's born from God? Those that love. Who who is uh, rejected from that? Those that hate. They don't have eternal life. So that we ourselves glory in you and the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions. So the righteous are what? Persecuted. Go out there and find the persecutees and then find the persecuted and you'll know who's who. Right? And in the afflictions which you endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God to the end that you may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God. In other words, you've got to bear your cross, and I'm going to, give, I'm going to send you some people that will help you get on it, right, and stay there, right? For which you suffer. We suffer for the kingdom of God, right? Amen. If so be that it is a righteous thing with God to recompense affliction to them that afflict you, and it is, he will afflict those that afflict you. They will not know what they're doing, just like Jesus when he was on the cross. Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. That's exactly right. It's gonna. It's happening in our day, and it will continue. And verse 7 says, And to you that are afflicted, rest with us at the revelation of the Lord Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power in flaming fire rendering vengeance to them that know not God and to them that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus. Are there Christians today that don't obey the gospel? Yes. Wow. You know, just we just read it, you know. Yes, there are many. And, and you tell them they're disobeying the word, they don't have a clue. Can't, you can't prick their conscience. They have no conscience. Who shall suffer, notice this, who shall suffer punishment, even eternal destruction from the face of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints. So where is he coming in his glory? In his saints. That's where he's separating the sheep from the goats. And to be marveled at in all them that believe. Notice the sequence of the book of Revelation, folks. The Lord comes at the end. He takes his saints and he's gone. When does he ever sit around physically and do separate the sheep from the goats or the sheep nations and the goat nations or whatever? When does he do that? No, he's doing that. He is doing that. He's going to be doing this through the tribulation period. He's going to do it in his people. He's going to sit on the throne of his glory. His throne is in your heart. The Bible says so. He'll come to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at in all them that believe because our testimony unto you was believed in that day. Yes, for those who believe, this great thing is going to happen. To which end we also pray always for you that our God may count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire of goodness every work of faith with power. For what reason? So that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you in him. So there's that glory again. The glory that he is coming in is in you and vice versa. And you in him. According to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this way this is what's going to separate the sheep from the goats. Is it happening now? Yes, it's happening now. Is it going to happen more so all the way through to the end? Yes, it's going to happen all the way to the end. This secret of uh, separation, um, the remember the, the man-child is the one you're going to have to be careful for. Because God is going to raise up a righteous life there that people are going to persecute and hate and revile and when they do, they're going to be reprobated. Those that will listen and obey, just like Acts chapter 3 said, uh, to all the words that that prophet brings forth, they are going to be blessed. They're going to be delivered. They're going to bear fruit. Because uh, like the disciples told Jesus when he said, will you two go away? That was around John 666 when they departed from him, the multitudes. He said, where else? They said, where else can we go, Lord? You have the words 
of life. And that's what the Lord's going to do. He is coming to shepherd his own sheep. Read Ezekiel 34. He is coming to shepherd his own sheep. And it says that in many scriptures in the Bible. He is coming to deliver us and to save and to judge the wicked and to judge in particularly the wicked so-called Christians who persecute the saints. And... Uh, there's going to be a great reprobation, a great falling away. Remember, the, the sheep and the goats are proven by actions. It's not whether you accepted Jesus as your Savior. It's whether you are doing it now. And according to actions, there are goats. And according to actions, there are sheep. Each man will be rendered according to his works. It has nothing to do with what you believe. It's do you believe it enough that you're walking in the steps of Jesus Christ. There is a great falling away happening now, saints. And these people are going to be just like those in, in uh, Matthew 13 that Jesus said, they don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. It's not been given to them to know the mysteries of the kingdom. The disciples, their mouth fell open. Lord, you're talking to them in parables. They don't understand. That's because it's not given to them to understand. Have you watched people that call themselves Christians and they don't listen to the Word of God and they have no ears and no conscience? All they do is persecute the saints? Yeah. Who are they proving that they are? Goats? Hares? I don't know which parable you want to uh, fly. Goats and tares. Remember, he's going to render to every man according to his works. You need to be patient in well-doing. You need to turn the other cheek. You need to resist evil. You need to not persecute those who God has given grace to. God's given grace to someone, and you condemn them. You are trying to destroy the very one he's giving grace to. If you don't give grace, you won't get grace. That's the facts. God can take grace away from you. You will be turned over to the devil. You'll understand your faults, but you won't be able to be delivered of them. It won't happen. Because as long as you judge, you will be judged. As long as you don't forgive, you will not be forgiven. I can tell you when that lion comes... There's some people that are not going to be forgiven, and he will have the authority to judge because the Lord Jesus is in him. There is a reprobation coming to a lot of people who have called themselves Christians but bought a brat, brought a bad name on Christianity. And the Lord is not going to put up with it. Well, Father, we ask for your grace today. Ask for your wisdom today, Lord. We um, desire earnestly that you um, save our brethren, Lord, from this reprobation that comes, that you would open eyes, you would have mercy. You know a day of of the lion is coming, the day of uh, judgment and not mercy is coming. And um, people are not fearing you, Lord. We ask you, Lord, to pour out your Spirit upon us. This great revival we know is going to bring some of the innocent back into the kingdom, which is awesome. This is what we need. This is what we desire. We desire it earnestly. Please help us, Lord. Thank you for your mercy and your grace towards us today, Lord. And thank you for pouring out your Spirit upon us and empowering us to be what we need to be. Thank you for giving us a desire, Lord, to uh, do the work of the kingdom. Lord, thank you for causing us to be well-pleasing in your sight, Lord. Thank you for doing this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good night, saints. i got to go, and uh, Lord bless you, and we'll do this again sometime, okay? can quench my thirsting soul Purest water make me whole Let your streams of mercy flow Oh Jesus, I trust in you The 
Though the mountains fall into the sea, though the rivers rise, I still believe. For your mercy stands and your word. For information and materials and to contribute, go to ubm1.org. Contributions only may be addressed to UBM PO Box 544 Madisonville, Tennessee 37354. The shining rays of red and white. Jesus, I trust in you. O sacred heart in you, I find mercy seated for all.